consent coming back to you. Yay. All right. Welcome, everyone. I think let's just go around the, the room and introduce ourselves. I'm Scotty. I'm from Arrington, BC. I'm Kelly. I live out in Enderby, British Columbia right now. Laddie? I'm Laddie, um, or Ladislav, whatever you prefer, and I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. <laughs> Zoe? I'm Zoe. I'm living in Coons, uh, not far from Scotty. Okay, Jay? I'm Justin. Um, I live in Nanaimo, not too far from Scotty as well. And last but not least, Serena. Hello, my name's Serena Winterburn. I live in the Cowichan Valley. All right. Here on Vancouver Island. Welcome, everyone. So I just want to, um, I think everyone here was either at Megan and Serena's event or at uh, the March or both. And I just want to know how that went. I mean, I, I'll go first. And then we'll, if anyone has any questions for me, um, you can, I'll take one or two and then we'll go to someone else and they can talk about it. I can say our event in Parksville was a success. Two thirds of our anti Soji speakers were gay or trans. Uh, there were so many people there from all different like walks of life and ages, and and then we got out. It was really interesting because the uh, we were. I was grateful because Parksville had so many older people. It seems like the union thugs stayed away, and uh, as soon as they had their little party time, it just vacated, uh, and then. We got a lot of positive uh, honking from cars going by. Um, I don't know if there's much to speak about that. We got reported as a hate group as usual. I don't know, Zoe. Zoe, you were there at the same one as me. Do you want to add any to anything to that? Oh, I can't hear you. I I kept tabs on the crowd. Uh, I actually got some panoramic shots of the uh, the group once they moved to the, the war memorial um, at City Hall. Um, so there was about uh, 150 people who gathered for the 1 million March for Children. There was about 45 uh, protesters. And initially um, people were, both groups were trying to occupy the same corner. And uh, what happened was that the, uh, the 1 million March moved to the war memorial and um so there was some space between the two and then when the march actually began there were the speakers uh, including yourself scotty and um and then when the march began uh the whole march went went through the protesters and i was certain that there was going to be some kind of you know aggression and i'm sure that there were words exchanged but there was there was no violence um, and i was glad for that there were a couple people who came um, to the uh, from the protest to the march to the war memorial and w w looked like they were trying to provoke something and in fact uh, one person got their sign ripped away from them um, by a million marcher um, and but there was uh, but then they they you know I guess that's what they came for they they turned around and went back to their to their corner and uh, then the march proceeded and I you know it went on for quite a while um and it, so that was really impressive uh seeing because you know when you when you go down the sidewalk this crowd of 150 takes up like several city blocks so it was really huge um i didn't see any police there um i had the sense that there was a whole range of opinions uh, like you said there were uh gay and les and gay and trans people at uh, speaking and um and there was a whole range of opinions but i think everybody agreed on just the one thing which is that uh parents sh should have the right to let their kids opt out of gender identity uh teachings in school and that um that's something that is not it's not appropriate to teach to, to very young children who really don't have a firm grasp on um, you know, what's real and what's made up and, uh, and that, you know, the parents are the ones who, who have the right to determine those kinds of, uh, those kind of teachings and, um, that the schools are doing the opposite and actually hiding, uh, trying to hide, 
um, what's going on in regards to gender identity in the schools and with the individual students themselves. So I, I kind of feel like, you know, in the bigger picture, I kind of feel like this might be uh, the start of a much bigger um, movement, you know, that, that this is a movement that's coming together. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be doing this on an ongoing basis, it sounds like, regular marches. And so I'm really curious to see what happens next. Thank you, Zoe. If anyone has any questions for us, or if anyone would like to go next, just raise your hand, either or. I can go next then. All right, go ahead. Um, so I was at the Verdon Million March. I spoke there. We met at City Hall. Um, we had found out two days before the march that the TQ plus protesters had pulled out a permit on the park because the organizers were trying to fly under the radar. Technically, we didn't need a permit to be in the park. So then last minute, they were having to pull a permit for another area in the park. Um, so they, when we got to the park, they had occupied the stage that we had intended to be at and gather at. So instead for a half hour, we went to the corn, like the park is right at the intersection of Highway 6 and Highway 97. So we were there for a half hour um, as just as traffic went by on all four corners, just holding up our signs and waving at the crowd. And a lot of traffic was honking their horns. Um, and then we, there was probably 10 marchers for every counter protester. So they were very quiet. They had cordoned off their area. I just got to admit someone, Glenn. Um, so they, they, they pretty much stayed within their area. Um, once we got there, it was Dr. Hoth um, spoke a fair amount about the biology of gender and got into the cellular level. Um, and that was a really interesting because I'd never heard anybody go in depth. And he talked about how <clears throat> the X chromosome, chromosome, the Y chromosome makeup determines everything about your metabolism so that was really good all right thank you and like welcome glenn to the room and um <clears throat> glenn is your glenn is from nanaimo glenn did you go to the million mark million march for children in nanaimo yeah, it, did. it was pretty good any can you hear me? violence yeah we can hear you now um, I... No, we're having troubles hearing you. I uh, was opposed to Sochi. That sorry, we're having troubles hearing you. There's a bit of lag. Oh, <laughs> right, about, um, why don't Why don't you leave and try rejoining the room? And uh, then maybe we'll hear from Serena because I want. I saw some very interesting stuff happen in Victoria that I'm very uh, curious well, about. <laughs> yeah, Glenn, you're frozen. Am I? <laughs> so are you Sorry. going out, Glenn, and coming back in? Then should I go yeah. ahead and begin? Go ahead and begin. Okay. So I was the MC for the Victoria One Million March for Children. I was invited to be um, to join the organizing as well, but I wanted to stay in the role of MCing. Um, I did some consulting along the way, like we just wanted to be extremely clear on those whom were organizing, what the vision was. I wanted to be clear on what the um thoughts across Canada were on the march from varying communities and so I I pulled out across TikTok kind of asking what what different um communities across Canada thought of the march whom was organizing it what the different ideologies were behind it and then we um talked here on the islands for the Victoria one and and we really 
wanted to be clear on what it was we were coming forward for. And, and it was about the children. And I would say, um, I want to echo the sentiments. I would say that the crowd was very diverse as well. We had quite a large um, representation of, I would say, parents as well. Um, you could see that there were different spiritual and religious communities present and that were diverse from Christian communities to Muslim communities um, as well, a lot who I would see in um, varying spiritual communities. And so I would say it was diverse. We were about 2,500 people is about the consensus that I'm seeing from multiple wow. sources. However, about 200 of us is also the consensus of how many of us were actually there as protesters for the 1 million March for Children. So we were essentially outnumbered by over 2,000 counter-protesters, which at first was extremely, um, it was okay because they were our local communities. They were our local um, organizers from our LGBTQ communities. They were, and they were counter-protesting. We could see that these were our community members who had been told a narrative. Now, once we began speaking, and and I was the first um, essentially to do a speech, the, the organizers introduced themselves and I came on, I, I spoke as the first speaker. Um, and then uh, Megan Murphy was our keynote speaker. And I would say by the time I, when while I was speaking, I found the, that the crowd mostly came down to a hush and they were listening. And so to me, I would say that was extremely um, effective. I would say that that was a success because people there were hearing, they were listening, they were, we were hearing each other. And it was towards the end of my speech that I would say that we began, there were witnesses, multiple witnesses who saw buses come in and um, protesters get off the buses. And these were the more aggressive um, Antifa style um, type of, um, which was quite different from the crowd that was there that was counter protesting, but were still respectful. They were chanting, but there was no vulgarity. There was no, um, the, the language was still respectful. Like you got to remember, we had children in the crowd, as I'm sure each and every one of you did. Um, by this point, they had pushed past. We had the police there who were holding a crowd barrier. And the counter protesters were supposed to be um, behind that crowd barrier that the police had ensured us that they were going to hold. Then on the other side of the police, that crowd barrier were supposed to be the protesters, us parents who were gathered and community members. And then we had our own security barrier and then the stage. Now, very quickly, by the time that those buses showed up, uh, they pushed right through the crowd barrier that the police were holding. And I had multiple um, protesters come and tell me personally, their personal accounts that the police didn't even try to stop them. And many of them said, like, you're supposed to be holding the crowd barrier. You're just letting them walk through. And they said, there's too many of them. So they didn't even attempt to. Um, and they pushed to the front. These are the ones who now, now they weren't listening. Now they're th the vulgarities that were being chanted and it was the megaphones and it was that disruptive behavior that many of us have seen put out by the unions and by, um, I, I guess what we would see as that mid-level violence that's being advocated for and really taught to be, um, used in protest and to drown out protesters. And mm -hmm. so we saw a lot of that behavior. It was taunting. It was antagonizing, um, screaming in the faces of elders, chanting vulgarities while children are there. Now, by this point, we were completely horseshoed in. Our community was completely horseshoed in by over 2,000 counter protesters, and it had become violent. They were and aggressive at that point. They were they were rushing through the the police barrier. Um, one of them had assaulted a police officer and was being violently arrested at our feet as we're saying our doing our speeches, um, trying to knock over the media table um, and and charging the stage. That was something else to be standing there. to see this kind of aggression, intimidation, and violence when you're 
when I, when I go back and I listen to my words personally that I spoke and I, I heard what I was giving voice to while this was happening, um, it speaks for itself. It speaks for itself. We held love. We held kindness. We held respect. We were there as respectful citizens who were trying to exercise our demo democratic rights, trying to give voice respectfully. We we were not goaded in. Um, the behavior, the middle level violence, was exactly that. It was violence. And for me and many, many others who have written me since or spoken to me personally about their experience, it was a traumatic experience, what we went through. For the police to shut us down and be the only event in Canada uh, for the one million marches across Canada that were shut down for aggression and violence, for, for the police to say to us, we're pulling the plug because the aggression and, and violence is escalating too quickly that we can't ensure anybody's safety. Um, to see the, this other level of protesters, when they pushed to the front, they pushed back um, what I would call our community counter-protesters, those who had been told a narrative, those who thought that this was something, that this was a hate event and they were there to stand for what they felt was right and just and 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 rightfully so. If it, it the, these events were deemed hate events, our own school district put out a letter using their platform the day before on Tuesday, the, the 19th, for SD 79 standing with the unions and deeming this a hate event. And they sent this to every parent on the mail list of SD 79. And I'm assuming they've done this in other um, school districts. Now, when I went down there and I asked them, I said, I am the MC of this event. I had the poster. I said, you're deeming, I said, you're implying that this event is a hate event. And, and their liaison said, no, we're not implying that. That is our hard stance. That is exactly what we are stating. We are taking a hard stand on this. We are against this and it is a hate event. And I said, but you haven't asked us for a statement. You haven't asked us what this is about, our intention. These are your families. We are your families here. And this is, I said, you guys are making a big mistake here. You have a an oversight because school grounds are supposed to be free of politics. And you've just opened the floor now, the school ground to politics in your short sight because you brought politics into the school now, right? And, and to see this and then to see these families come out and many of the union workers who were paid and, and got the day off to come and stand against hate and for them to be listening. Now, I'm going to say, I don't know if you guys have had an opportunity to go see the Times colonist out of Victoria I was, I'm going to say again, another success is what the, the article they wrote. And they said that their journalist said, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recall the name offhand, but said for those who were there to listen to the speeches, there was one speaker in particular that nobody can disagree with and spoke about how I was talking about our communities are hurting, our societies are sick, our communities are sick, every one of our communities. And he said that what he heard next left him speechless and talking about our responsibility to hear each other, our responsibility to come together to speak, right? This is, this is what I put forward in my messaging. I'm not here to say I fought for my rights or, or you fought for yours and, and these rights are relevant right now, but now we're fighting for these rights. It's recognizing that we've all stood for fighting for rights at some point, whether it's the right to vote or the right for to, to be married to who we love, the right to for medical autonomy or bodily autonomy. It doesn't matter what we stood and voted for. We've all stood for rights at some point. And we need to recognize that these are community issues. They can't be legislated away. They can't be censored away. They can't be antifa away. We need to hear each other. And we need to, in my perspective, we need to come together and as communities. Because if we just keep coming in this same way, then we're just we're just doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. But 
who's doing the work that's revolutionary, that's going to take it to the next level in our conversations, in our communities, in our dialogue, in our discourse, in our conflict resolutions, in our being able to say, not, do more than just proclaim these rights, but actually say we're ready to do the work. And so that's what I spoke on that stage. That's what nobody could disagree with. That's what this Times colonist wrote about and called out what he deemed the left's and said, we have we have a responsibility to hear each other here. So to me, I would say that while we were shut down, we conducted ourselves in a way that I would say was impeccable in our character, what we stood for, our values. And, and it was more the counter behavior that was concerning in society. And, and so many were really taken back by it. And, and it was eye-opening for them. They went... You know, I came under a certain narrative and what I saw was the exact opposite. What I heard was the opposite. So this was effective, even though it shook our security, even though it was immoral, even though it showed the ugliest parts of our society. It also showed some of the most beautiful parts too and a potential. I'm so happy you were you were the one to facilitate that. I mean, I watched your stream after and cried. I was like, you're so brave to stand in the face of that. And you're so loving. My God. Thank you for sharing, Serena. We have a new guest to the room. Hi. Hey. I just kind of noticed that my chat is about to end. I'm going to try and put money on it here. Hang on. <laughs> we, I would like to, um, let's just put the talk into, we can, s sorry, Laddie, I, I meant to ask you, to, how is Edmonton? <laughs> I'm the worst okay. moderator. That's okay, though. Like, I'm, I'm a train wreck and I come by it honestly. <laughs> I think I speak for everybody and you're doing a stellar job, so... Uh... Don't worry. There, there's so many of us that gathered up tonight that that uh, it can't be easy to take care of all of it all at the same time. I, yeah, I'm, I was here at the march in Edmonton, but before I before I say anything about it, um, I'd like uh, uh, to uh, say something about Kelly and your experience from Vernon. You said that there were some issues about you being in the park, like that you you don't need a permit or do, but. Uh, do you know how it's worked? I think that the parks, as long as they're owned by city, then uh, then you do need a permit. But if, if you're in like a public space, like say if it's just like a grassy area, but not like a designated park, you know, like at an intersection corner or such, then I think you don't need one at all. Or do you know how it, it worked? In, in Vernon, it had to do with how much time we would be in the park. Right. And um, the so so they were... The, the time we were going to be in the park was under the permit requirements mm -hmm. and the anticipated size of the gathering. Um, so they were concerned if they tried to pull a permit that the RCMP would try to shut it down as a hate crime, as a hate gathering. Um, actually, the police ended up extremely cooperative. Um, we had far more trouble with bylaw than we did with the police in the end. Bylaw right. came over when, when we'd set up our sound system, bylaw came over and shut it down. And then someone came forward um, from the crowd and said, uh, spoke with the organizers and said, if there's, if you, if you get a fine, I'll cover the cost of the fine. So we set our sound system back up. Yeah. That's community spirit. It's right there. That, that, that was last minute, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, I've also had a question on Serena, if I may. Uh, it's kind of, kind of in the same theme because you were saying how the, the police was terribly unhelpful and the barriers kind of fell apart. Um, I was curious, was it uh, the Victoria police or was it the RCMP? So um, I, just to clarify, um... I would say they that I would say they were unsuccessful in holding their crowd barrier. However, when it came to protecting the stage, I was grateful for their presence and holding back those whom were getting violent and rushing the stage. So I do want to be fair. 
Um, I, these were the police, not the RCMP. So this was the Victoria police, but it looked like the bulk of them were the Saanich police, which we've seen this previously at protests in Victoria. They bus in or they not bus in, but they bring in the Saanich police. Um, I would say that another um, interesting but obvious short sight on their part, um, I would say almost a negligence on their part, is that they were way understaffed, which doesn't make very much sense because they had very clear directives all across Canada for the police that they were to hold the crowd barriers and keep the counter protesters separate. There were also a lot of indi indicators with this rally specifically that this was extremely controversial. And because of the rise in aggression and assaults that had previously been taken place towards those who had been speaking on similar topics, it was already known with law enforcement that this could potentially become aggressive or violent. So to play naive in the end, I would say, is 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 an interesting um stance i would say it's more a negligent one but in the end i was grateful for them holding back those protesters at the stage who were charging the stage and and for the arrests that were made awesome my, my experience in edmonton with the uh, edmonton police service was absolutely wonderful they were uh, they were helping us so much they kept the crowd separate um they made sure at one point that nobody could cross the street at all, which I guess some people felt like it was a bit of an infringement, I guess. But we were separated by a three three stream road, so very, very far. Uh, there was one person that managed to sneak in to the crowd of protesters, but uh, the police was at him within seconds and three of them escorted him to the crowd of the counter protesters. I think uh, there was approximately 2000 protesters for parental rights and approximately a third i would say of counter protesters so we outdid them very very much <laughs> and uh the police like i say um uh, they were great they escorted us all along the march which was uh, about 45 minutes around a few blocks um uh, they had a uh, advance notice so they were able to reroute all of the emergency vehicles somewhere else so as we took our one lane of the traffic, there was no inconvenience for um, ambulances or fire trucks. That was absolutely amazing. And um, as far as the protest itself, it was a very mixed community. There was a lot of Sikhs, a lot of Muslims, a lot of Christians. I think, I think a lot of atheists as well. There was a Catholic school nearby the protest where I hear students were forbidden from attending. And they had a mayor, a mayor, the uh headmaster actually uh guard the parking lot taking making sure that no students actually can come and uh before i think uh sneaked out <laughs> to the protest and uh, actually uh there was an open mic uh at the end where they actually got to speak and say their opinion it was uh three 16 year olds uh christian boys <laughs> forbidden from attending i thought that was pretty powerful for me uh, there was a counter protester truck that uh, decided to kind of aggressively drive really close to a uh, few people where the police didn't really do very much about that. I heard some outrage about it, but nobody got hurt. It was more aggressive driving, I think, rather than like running over somebody. But um, it, it brought back my favorite moment of the Edmonton March where the same truck came back around and honking. And of course, people hung in support of the protest. So as he comes back and honks, everybody goes cheering because they assumed it was for us. And uh, he suddenly panicked in his face and he was on a red light. So <laughs> couldn't do anything about it. And the crowd slowly stole his honking for, for the favor of the protest, which I thought was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, there was a speaker uh, from the Sikh community. There was a lot of praying, Sikh, uh, Muslim praying, Christian praying. It was, it was really nice how everybody just let everybody else be. Uh, but I think for me, uh, Miss Strong from the child, uh, what is it, uh, Child Health Defense, Ch Children Health Defense Canada, she, she had some really, really strong points in her speech uh, on transgenderism and um, say environmental factors that could factor into, into things like that. Uh, 
Another person that kind of stood out for me was uh, Benita Peterson. She was the organizer. She was wonderful. <laughs> uh, there was uh, Melanie Sweet of uh, Alberta for Liberty. Um, she's uh, she's organizing a rally, a sort of pre pre March <laughs> this Saturday, where uh, she's uh, labeled it "Let Kids Be Kids," and she's uh, gathering all of the like minded people for a little rally, and. Uh, the march was actually what uh, turned me into an uh, activist. I haven't done anything before, but uh, for me, the message of being uh, being called a homophobe while I'm peacefully marching with a whole bunch of pro uh, you know parents and nobody cared. I um, we've actually uh, I'm Christian and uh, I've connected with other Christians at the march. <laughs> yeah, so there was absolutely zero homophobia, and I was. <laughs> I felt like it was my duty to to say, "Hey, this is not a homophobic crowd." So, there I am. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were there. Now we have. I want to welcome Jenea to the room. Hi. Yes. So, Hi. I'm, and yeah. um, so, thank you all of the everyone too. And I'm, I think Jenea, you you went to the march in Nanaimo as well. Yeah, I was just. Uh, listening to what you said about Edmonton, that's wild. Like I was here in Nanaimo and that it was like a completely like different experience. There was probably, gosh, I don't even know. There was, I'm bad with like looking at crowds and thinking how many people are there, but there was probably, I would say like at least like there was probably only about a hundred people that were there like marching for the kids and there was probably about two maybe there was 150 but there was at least 200 counter protesters like we were like way outnumbered um and at one point they started blasting like there was kids there obviously and everything and at one point they started blasting pornography um it was wild like it was just like what are you doing like we have kids in this crowd like it was mental and they were bit clanging like cowbells like really loudly like every time because we didn't have like the best um the best like speaker system um uh because i know again we we didn't i think where it was set up it was kind of set up in like a poor spot but i mean i'm not i'm not knocking david at all because he had to rearrange things so many different times um but I think it was kind of set up in like not the best spot um and but maybe he did it there so that I don't know just so that like people couldn't surround us I'm not too sure uh, but anyway they were clanging yeah. bells at the time that we would get on the mic to like speak like so people couldn't yes we could hear but you know you kind of had to really be close to like be able to actually hear what people like what the people were saying and stuff um one woman I think like just tried to like she was kind of out by the edge um and the cops weren't like they weren't doing a good job of keeping the protesters away from us like at all um and this protester actually she had a Canadian flag on a stick and this protester came up with a massive knife and sliced her Canadian flag uh and the police did absolutely nothing and she was like terrified she was an older woman like you know probably I would say 60 like you know not like a young kid or anything and uh yeah it was it was wild, honestly, like they were being really harsh with the things that they were saying towards us and just like with the cloud bells, like not letting us talk. And then again, like blasting pornography, like, are you joking? And then they started playing like music, like really loudly, like they were just being very disrespectful. Um, and our crowd was great. Like everyone was calm. Nobody was yelling at them. Um, but yeah, it was unfortunate that there wasn't that many people I think the thing is, is that a lot more people wanted to come, but unfortunately, you know, uh, one of my girlfriends got up and spoke and she was terrified because she hadn't yet resigned from school district 68 and all the school district 68 employees, um, were told if they attended, obviously they would lose their jobs. Right. And then same with my buddy, he works for BC ferries. Um, and he got his union emailed him. Sorry, my dog's going crazy. Um, emailed like everyone in their union and said if they if they went they would lose their jobs as well so I think there was a lot of people that you know would have wanted to go but obviously you know their freedoms have been taken away right and they're not able to do the things they want to because their union's telling them that so you know um, yeah I don't know it was it was definitely it was it was kind of scary like being down there with with uh, how violent how violent they were but um, 
yeah, I mean, we did our best, right? So. Oh, I, I can't hear you at all, Scott. I don't know. Thank you, you everyone for standing and continue. Like, as I'm hearing chatter leading up to this next one, there's a lot of division trying to work its way in. I know many, uh, like, especially with what's happening in the Middle East, some people are t bringing this into the group. And um, we just have to remember to hold that line and love that it's about the kids. And, and we've talked to, Laddie and I were talking to a lesbian woman the other night who's been, and, and myself too, I, we, we've had more and more like traditional homophobes join and kick us out of these groups saying, no, these are child predators, kick them out. Like we're having, that rise up in the underbelly where Muslims are being attacked by people and gay people are being attacked and like there's the, the, the classic division. So we have to hold the line and love and make sure we're not sucked into hating our neighbor. Yeah. We haven't heard from Jay. Yeah. Um, I'm just listening to everyone. Um, I actually didn't attend the event. I had to work. So I haven't gotten any um, letters from my union yet, but um, I'm a teamster, so I imagine I'll hear from that very soon. But uh, my daughter, we kept her home from school that day. And uh, the incident that uh, Janae was just talking about with the leg being cut with the knife was actually um, my friend Maxim's mom. Yeah, and, she um, be. I talked to her for a while. It was brutal. Yeah, she's a Ukrainian refugee, actually. They came here about 20 years ago. And uh, it, it, <laughs> it's just crazy because I, I couldn't believe it when he told me it almost sounded far-fetched, but it, it really sounds ter like terrorism, to be honest with you. Some of the things that are happening, it, it doesn't seem like peaceful protests in some cases, you know? And uh, I it, it's it's sad because uh, it's, it's standing up for kids. So why would you fight like that, you know? Well... Uh I think, unfortunately, a lot of the people are <clears throat> brainwashed, right? Like, they didn't even know, well, I think. It, yeah. Like, like, why they there, or, like, what they were, like, fighting for. I mean, even these people that have all now come against me, calling me, like, a Nazi, a transphobe, uh, you know, all these different names. I don't even know the meaning of half the names that they're calling me. And it's like, hey, I literally kicked a predator out of my daughter's bathroom. How does that make me transphobic or a nazi or anything like i'm just and that's, speaking the thing, and that's why you became an advocate in the first place that's why you you know became a it, yeah. it's just ridiculous on how, how people would even fight this you know yeah if i may um I, I want to go back to the topic. Like I, I had brought up the word mid-level violence and there's actually a great podcast out mm -hmm. Um, that really breaks down what mid-level violence is and how this is being utilized in activism right now. And, and we see it a lot in the Antifa um, tactics, but these are, these are tactics that are actually taught um, to, to disrupt protests, to disrupt um, any kind of other activism. And, and so these tactics are mid-level violence. They're provocative and they're meant to be. They're meant to drown you out. They're meant to antagonize you. They're meant to provoke you. It's meant to, but it's not, we got to realize that with mid-level violence, it's not actually stopping us and censoring us and and drowning us out those are the actions the provocative actions but their actions are actually towards <laughs> our reactions yeah. so it's it's meant to provoke a reaction <laughs> to be captured and then taken out of context and so you have two ways that you can respond oh. to this it's you could either a respond by having no response and they're screaming in your face saying i'm not touching you i'm not touching you i'm not touching you they're cutting your flag they're and you've got to remain and not do anything that's one way but that's demoralizing demoralizing that that to 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 be 
the recipient of that kind of aggression is abusive, like, and, and it's difficult to have no reaction and many can hold it and bless them for that. But then we have those then who have a reaction where it's, they're being provoked. And so what sometimes the reaction looks or is taken out of context. So it's, it's, um, I guess, documented looking as though it's out of context and too big now they've got the reaction they want and they can break down beha your behavior as aggressive and transphobic and against this community and violent or what against mm -hmm. counter protesters so those are the two reactions that they want however there's also the third reaction and that's the one where you can be strategic and understand the tactics that are being utilized where you are proactive and you're actually documenting everything yourself as well. You're documenting it so you can keep it in context and you can put it out forward and you could show, wait a minute, this is mid-level violence. You're right. You're not touching me, but you are provoking me. This is aggression. You are, you are being aggressive and you're documenting the behavior and calling it out for exactly what it is. Yeah. Because that's effective in society because that's actually what the war is. Yeah. I, that's I agree. where the battle is. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the rest of society who's not standing there on the line. It's the media. It's the families with the six o'clock news watching at home. It's it's our school board trustees. It's our families getting the newsletters. It's the ones who don't know and aren't going to see the truth of it. Those are the ones whom we're showing, wait a minute, look at this behavior. Those are the ones who were stepping back at the protest going, wait a minute, this isn't what I was told it is. What I'm hearing doesn't match what I was told it is. And the behavior I'm watching from counter protests makes me question who the heck am I standing with right now? Right? Like this is calling out our societies now and well, the behavior that we normalize. Yeah. Even when I did like, when I did that second kind of like, I don't, know, I don't like to rally, but after the incident happened at the NAC and then I did another like gathering downtown Nanaimo, <clears throat> this girl brought a bunch of like trans activists there and I was speaking to the crowd that was there. And then the trans activists came up behind me and they were like losing their mind. There was like a bunch of teenagers, like probably 20, maybe 20 of them, maybe 15. They were freaking out on me. And I just like, I said to them, I said, Hey, can I come a bit closer to you? Um, Cause I didn't have like a mic or anything. And they were like, kind of like caught off guard, but they're yelling at me and I'm asking them if I can come closer to them to have a conversation. And then when I went closer to them and they allowed me to tell my story and what happened that day at the pool, and they allowed me to say like, you know, this is what I'm looking for. Like, I don't hate you guys. I don't, you know, I'm not against you. Like, I just want protection for my daughter. And like, don't you want protection if somebody is transphobic and is really rude towards you? Like, don't you want protection too? And kind of like spun it like that and talk to them by the end of it. They were all cheering for me. They all asked if they could get a picture with me. They were super pleased with me. And I was just like, yeah, like they actually listened to me and, and, and I was able to get through to them and I was able to show them, Hey, I'm not hateful. This is just a scary scenario. Right. And so I think they all get fired up by somebody fueling that fire, feeding them a bunch of lies. And then they don't even know what they're fighting for. They think they're fighting for something, but they actually don't even know, you know what I mean? So I think it's like finding like that you know, I was fortunate that day that those kids weren't violent towards me and, you know, that they, <clears throat> that they did sit there and listen to me. And, and so it was good, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I think just like diffusing the situation, right. And like being able to, you know, like we've talked about hopefully having some sort of like panel where we can speak and, you know, we can, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, because that's, that's really at the end of the day, it's like, Hey, like we all are here we all want rights, you know, we all want safety for kids. Like, you know, it's just, it's a scary, it's a scary thing. And I, I think people are easily brainwashed by the media and by the outside influences and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that they don't really know what they're even fighting for. <laughs> yeah. I know when the rallying cry for the counter protest went out in Vernon, there was no details given to people at all. It was just there's going to be an extremely transphobic event in Vernon on September 20th at Polson Park. Um, gather the rainbows, circle the unicorns. Um, but people had no details whatsoever. Um, 
my one friend who was forwarding the rallying call when I told her I'd be speaking at the event and <clears throat> that this was the event I had been telling her about that I was attending. She ended up taking her posting to forward it down from her Facebook and didn't attend the counter protest. But there were there was absolutely no details um, yeah. <laughs> whatsoever except the time and the location of the event. I think every event was like that. And that's something that I called out the school board for. And as well in, in mm. co social content, um, the, the, our government, the media as well. At, well, not them, the media, I would say was a little better on this one, but, but even the unions, <laughs> right? Like there were no details and there were a lot of creative liberties taken, which was completely unnecessary because that's not, you know, there were no interviews. There was no asking for statements from any organizers, MCs, speakers. What is this event about? They never went to any of the sites. They didn't reference the posters. Like it was just absolute creative liberty and completely taking it out of context and then publishing this on to all the families through the school board, all the union members. Like this is absolutely, this is our school's. These are their families. These are parents. This is, this is wow. Can I speak wow. to that for a minute? And then I want to hear from Gwen, but I was just wanted to say, um, I probably don't have a job. I don't know because I'm too afraid to check my email. I got a letter from my employer and my union telling me how hateful I was. And so as many chapters of my life could be entitled when keeping it real goes wrong <laughs> happened and i sent them a swift email telling them like i spoke there many of my friends did and i said where are you i mean my, where are you for women having to share their spaces with men where where are you for women and where are you to steer this homophobia like real homophobia why am i in there speaking and having to navigate real homophobia on in it and try and stand up and and respect everyone's right i said that's the union's job but you mobilized them against me and i said furthermore i know exactly what it's like to be one of these kids i mean i was bullied by my the whole town my teachers the students and that teacher ended up being my coach and, and the mayor of the town and these kids just bullied me right the hell out of town. I said, you guys made me feel just like that. I said, labor knows me and this is a small town and I go out and people are coming at me. They're coming at me to say good or they're coming at me with rage. And I just don't even like going to the store. I said, I'm not coming back to work until you fix it. <laughs> and I said, if I can't grieve it, I'll just sign up with the Muslims and do a class action. Like I just, I'm so disappointed in them. Anyways, I wanted to hand over to Gwen to speak because I feel I've been hogging. Well, I just want to say hi to everybody. I see Serena's left a message that you have to go to a meeting. And um, it's a pleasure to see you again, Serena. Last time we were together at the panel on October 1st. And um, I thought that you spoke so eloquently to the crowd when there was the Q&A session. So it's always a pleasure to meet up with you again. And of course, I recognize Jenea. And there's Zoe. And um, to the rest of you, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm not used to being called a hater. I have to say I'm starting to get, uh, uh, it's kind of, a, it's weird. <laughs> I am used to being called a radical leftist, a communist. I'm used to being on, you know, that side, right? Mm -hmm. And um, to see this flip around um, over an issue that I think just, you know, makes, makes a lot of sense. It's difficult. And I think we all kind of experienced that. That's the feeling I got when I spoke to the panelists who um, who were on the panel on the October 1st and then and the next one that was October 4th. Just this, this trying to wrap your brain around being labeled a certain way. And um, I did not attend the rallies, but I do understand the importance of parents in children's lives. <laughs> And, and I also know too, having been a former uh, politician, the people are coming to me now and sharing stories. And yes, they're anecdotal and you know, no, there isn't really data. I don't know who's gathering this data, but there's a lot of harm happening to families um, since gender ideology has, has um, 
you know, entered the school system and also to, of course, online. And I mean, I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of things like strife between parents, children coming home and using it kind of as a way to get out of chores even, you know, like having a, a, a pronoun jar. Oh, you misgendered me. I'm they, them, you know, and, and parents kind of scratching their head going, what is this, you know? Um, but even more extreme, you know, um, extreme stories I've heard from people. I, one young man told me that, you know, it took his life for five years from the age of 13 to 18. He was so confused. And I, he joined a, um, I guess it was a pride group in his school. And he believed he was non-binary. And then he started believing that he um, was actually born in the wrong body and maybe should take hormones. And he said he was cutting and he was just so depressed at that point in time and really alienating himself from his parents who were really worried about him to the point where he felt like, you know, he just wanted to end his life. And finally, his dad stepped in and said, look, we're not going to consent to you taking these medications. But you can do that as an adult, if that's what you really think. But I really want you to take time and, and apply critical, critical thought to, you know, what you're involved in. And the fact there's been so many rapid changes, and you know, the fact that you're going through puberty, and it's just a difficult time. And, you know, you're a smart young man. Um, so, you know, really apply some critical thought. And, um, and he did. And then he came to the realization that he's just a boring, straight, gay male. And he just didn't want to be part of the patriarchy, as he said to me. He said, Gwen, it's just not something I wanted to be part of. It's just so, you know, normal. And I wanted to be special. <laughs> and he said, once he figured it out, it all just sort of lifted. So he went back to his friends, you know, the loving people, you know, the ones that aren't the haters. And he told them, he said, you know what, I, I was wrong. I think I got caught up in this weird trend and I'm not non-binary and actually I'm pretty happy. I want you to start calling me he, him because I'm a guy. And they turned on him. He started getting hateful emails, even to the point where they said, you know, you really should just end your life because it would be better not having you here because you're causing harm to our community by doing this. Yeah. So I think it's such a strange, I mean, I, I know I came in the middle of the conversation. I listened to what Ser Serena was saying, you know, um, and, and Jenea, it, it's such a strange thing because it's calling somebody a hater, but then using hate in the process. And it's kind of mind boggling in, in this, this way but there's there's this feeling that of moral superiority that I'm sensing, I think, from from the people that are proponents, you know, and what I mean by proponents, I mean, like really rigid, you know, it has to be this way or else. Um, no consideration of sex based rights or the fact that there may might be some, you know, some issues. Um, it's and it, it's bizarre. So I, I think when I come in here and, and I and we're all kind of talking, I, I just that's sort of the, the place where I'm at is just trying to figure this out because it is kind of difficult to really figure out to wrap your brain around. I, too, have experienced um, a bit of pushback, not a lot. But when I decided to moderate the event on October 1st, somebody from the activists, the trans activist group, found my name linked to an association and called the university I graduated from to wow. um, request that I, you know, be fired. But this group, I'm, I'm actually a volunteer. <laughs> I'm not a paid employee, but they wanted me fired. <laughs> and um, and they, they did, they put a complaint in that I was, you know, transphobic. And it really kind of, it was perplexing, you know, to the leadership of the university and, and the person that they wound up connecting with, just perplexing, like what exactly has been done that would be considered, you know, hateful. And of course they couldn't really find anything, you know, but um, I'm fortunate uh, that they don't know where I really work. <laughs> and I'm fortunate that the people that they contacted, you know, had enough sense to say, well, we need, we need evidence. Because a lot of times there is no evidence. It's just this yeah. is where you've been labeled a certain way. And, and so we're going to act. So I'll pass it back over to you, Scott. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> you caught me mid smoke. <laughs> oh, Lord. 
Laddie, do you want to have something to say? I don't know. I, I, don't... I would I would love to. I wanted to say hello to Gwen. I'm great. I'm pleased to meet you. I watched your event through Serena's live stream. So even though I wasn't at Island Speaks, I, I saw it. And uh, of course, I saw the the news report that uh, that was made onto onto the event. And uh, one of the cuts that I absolutely adored was you speaking to the police, just saying which areas you need to have cleared of the protesters. So <laughs> I, I thought I thought that was absolutely beautiful. And uh, thank you for holding it up. And you might not have been at a protest, but uh, you definitely got enough pushback at the at the event that you organized. That you, I think I think you got it worse than. Uh, than some of us at the actual protest, or at least here in Edmonton. Like I said, we were kept apart by a three-lane road, so it was fairly easy. There was no interaction allowed. There was a row of police with bicycles that we were not allowed to cross the street. There, There is a kind of like a citizen journalism group here in Edmonton called Yeg United, and they actually managed to uh, to send a person in, in disguise, in sort of rainbow clothes, to to at least have a little bit of understanding what's happening in the opposite camp. And uh, they were mostly peaceful. They, they were yelling and uh, they had some loud stereo trying to drown the crowd, but they couldn't. There was this uh, parkade we were really close that was about three story high. And they had about maybe 30 by 20 foot big progressive pride flag, you know, with all the extra stripes and wedges and circles and such. And uh, after the rally disassem dis disassembled, people started going home and wherever somebody uh, took the big, big pride flag down. Uh, the police is currently looking for somebody who did it. There is a lot of discussion as whether it could be like a, a way to make our movement look bad, as if somebody from uh, the rainbow crowd could actually sort of do it to, to put the pressure on us. Um, hard to say. The fact is, it uh, it came down after the the protest happened. I was there myself, and it seems like the media is trying to spin it like it happened during our protest and sort of trying to bedmouth the movement that way. Of course, you know the far right and all the usual stuff, but I'm sure you've all heard that before. <laughs> I found it. Yeah, I I think. Go ahead. Oh, man. sorry, Scott. Um. And I think too, like um, this whole idea, like, oh, somebody removed a pride flag. You know, it just, it, it, it's <laughs> like, that is just such a terrible thing to do, you know, um, unless of course you put the, the pride flag there or I, I don't know. I, I mean, there's just, yeah. And, and it, it, it suddenly, it makes it onto news. Suddenly that becomes the issue is, you know, um, there was some rumor that somebody took down a, a pride flag, you know, and uh, that's the story, right? And everybody in the group are a bunch of white supremacists. Um, really, it, it, and, and you know, it's really interesting because the whole idea behind the push towards gender ideology and the push towards being tolerant, you know, is that, you know, our system, the systems are, are not so binary, right? And yet when it comes to this issue, it's a very binary issue. It's like, you either accept what we have to say or you are bad. And there's no discussion mm -hmm. in between, right? It suddenly becomes, you know, dare I yeah. say, binary. <laughs> so I think that's really unfortunate. I think the other the other story that really should be told is, you know, like what Scott had mentioned that, you know, um, you had Muslims and Christians and immigrants and indigenous people and people from the mm -hmm. left, people from the right, people who are moderates, you had all kinds of people kind of coming together and, and saying, yeah, you know what, this, this is disturbing. And, you know, we want to stand up for parental, the, the parental rights, the ability to know when our, ch when our children are um, going to use another pronoun or change their names at school. Yeah. I, oh, sorry, Gwen, keep on going. No, I, no, well, please jump in no. there. Well, I was just going to say, I think like even last night I was talking to, uh, my girlfriend, um, who our daughters go to the same school, and she was horrified when I, I think I sent you, like, before the, before I talked on October 1st, I think I sent you, or maybe it was after, uh, the book that I was able to take out of her library, like, at school, and those pictures, so I was showing my girlfriend, I'm like, look, like, this is, like, the reason that, like, Soji is not good, like, a lot of parts of Soji is, like, not good, and I, like, showed her, and she was just horrified, because she's just hearing, 
you know, people are hateful that don't like Soji or that mm-hmm. aren't accepting it or whatever. And she didn't even realize like that her daughter could have taken that book out of the school at age 10. There's people having sex in there. There's, you know, like, like people bent over with a mirror expe- um, examining their vagina and their penis and like all this. And it's just like, that is like not age appropriate in my opinion for a 10 year old. My 10 year old should not be able to see people having sex. I don't care if they're gay, they're straight, they're whatever. Like she just shouldn't. Like you're not allowed to watch porn until you're 18 or 19 or whatever it is, but you're allowed to take a book out of your school library with people having sex in it. And it even said in the book, it said, uh, what did it say? Let me like, let me get it up here so I can tell you exactly what it said, just so that I'm not gonna screw something up. It says, uh, sorry, I have too many pictures on my phone. Um, oh, it's right here. It's right around here. Um, oh, dang it, Janaya. Where is it? Oh, it's right here. Uh, it says, uh, it's not on this page. Sorry, I gotta look at the other page. It says, but most people don't have sexual intercourse only when they want to make a baby most often they have sexual intercourse because it feels good why does my 10 year old need to know that like do you know what i mean like i'm so sorry but like like that's not <clears throat> again like you know like i just think that that is like so yeah and just to touch again on what you said about like you know i mean honestly after i spoke on the panel on october 1st i didn't say anything transphobic I didn't say anything. In fact, when Drea interviewed me, I once again, like I always have, have stood up for the transgender community and said, this was not a trans person that was in the public pool. This was a predator appropriating transgender identity to gain access to my child. He tried to look under the stall at my nine-year-old child changing. I'm so sorry, but that's not a transgender person. A transgender person would come in the washroom, get changed like everybody else and get out of the bathroom. They wouldn't be trying to creep on little kids. They would have a pool bag. You know what I mean? And, um, and, and outside that day when Dre interviewed them, they even knew my full first name and last name and was, and said like, Janaea Wright is spewing hate. She's wrecking our town or whatever they said with all her hate filled messages. And I'm like, do you hear yourself right now? Like, do you like, that's the part to me that's like mind bending is I'm like, I literally have never once said anything wrong about transgender or about their community. In fact, I tried to reach out to them numerous times, never got responses. Every interview I've done with, uh, you know, with, <clears throat> with, of course, CBC didn't put my interview on there because of course, you know, they can't put anything on there. They heaven forbid, they put something on where trans activist kids are freaking out at me and then I can defeat situation and calm them down heaven forbid they put that on there right um and so but any like check news and stuff like I never once said anything rude but in fact they're slandering my business they tried to take away my best of the city award um they have came by my house taken pictures of my home they've plastered photos of my children of myself uh, uh sharing it all over social media saying that how horrible I am my son's work somebody came in there and was like tried to say something to him and he was like I'm gonna knock this person out like I gotta go in the back like I need to keep my mouth shut but like they're harassing my family like this community of people that are calling me hateful are literally harassing my family and children it's just it's crazy to me it's like who's the hateful ones here like let's take a minute and think about this oh wait we don't have to think about it you know and and there's a blindness to their own um their own poor behavior um i think there was one person um who is a you know former new democrat member and he posted look you know in all the years that i've you know fought against conservatives in elections or debated them no conservative ever came after me and called me hateful no conservative ever tried to um sabotage my employment or destroy my life um this is just such an extreme movement like honestly there's really no care there's no care (laughs) there's no care for you and your ability to actually feed your child because they want to destroy your business so you no longer have money there there's no care about your safety and obviously the privacy of your child when they're sending out those images and 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 plastering your name all over the place so you know you kind of have to ask do you really care about children at all like it's supposed to be mm -hmm. I mean the mantra is that soji soji saves children's lives right but your child's life doesn't matter 
Yeah. My three kids' child's yeah. lives. Don't, like I said, I, like going yeah, into my, yeah, like going into my son's work and like harassing like an 18 year old kid, like me right now, like because of something his mom's doing, like just unbelievable. He's just like, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. It's the hypocrisy and just like, it's, it's, yeah, it just, it does, it honestly doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I'm just like how I was speaking to a friend of mine last night who's gay and, uh, he's been, he's been standing up for me a lot online because he knows me really well. He's like a young kid and, uh, <clears throat> but it's been like nice. And we had a really good chat and we talked about Soji actually as well. And he was saying like, I'm <laughs> so that that wasn't in school when I was in school because I'm a gay man and I would have probably went to trans because I, w because I was so confused, you know, becoming a fort, like it was around 14 when he kind of like came out, but he's like, I never really had to come out because my family already knew, but he's like, you know, this kind of around that time. And he's like, you know, I was so confused at that time. I didn't know what was going on and whatever. And he's like, and you know, I would have, this would have happened to me kind of like the story you were just saying about, you know, that, that gentleman or the younger kid that you talked to, um, you know, and he's like, yeah, I, I'm just so great because I think that that's what this is doing. It's confusing kids so much. Um, it's, it's just, it's terrible. And it seems like there's no behavior that they won't rally around and defend an individual. There's the extreme case of the shooter down in the United States that happened recently. Mm -hmm. And now the um, trans queer um, activists are coming out and defending the shooter who killed yeah. other people and as the victim. The, the, the shooter yeah. is the victim of transphobia. Right. It's interesting because I have been through uh, a similar um, level of hysteria and, mm -hmm. and anger and hatred and we're going to destroy your life. And it was with a group of white supremacists in Victoria. Um, they, uh, they were a group who invaded the Occupy movement and uh, said, mm -hmm. you know, they, they tried to take it over because, you know, and, and change everything. Say this country was built by white Christian men. And so we won't do any land acknowledgments and you all are wrong. And all I did was make fun of them on Facebook and they declared war on me. And yes, they were going to destroy my life. Yes, they were going to blackmail me. Um, uh, they were so out of control and it's, um, and it's interesting cause yeah, again, there's a similar lack of thought and uh, they called me a, a commie and a Nazi and an anarchist and a fascist and all these things. Uh, so that was kind of similar, but I think, um, what they had in common was this, this identity, this identity politics where they were so attached to their identity as being superior beings, you know, that they felt like they could get away with anything. They felt like they could order the police to do what they wanted, um, that they are were somehow, you know, part of this master class, this master race, these, these, uh, this, they were supposed to be in charge. And so they felt quite entitled to, to, to use those tactics. Like they were not afraid of any consequences. And, uh, and they actually really didn't have any consequences for the threats and things that they did. Um, but I just, I just wanted to put that out there. This is, it's a similar kind of all consuming ideology where in, in the minds of these guys, you know, who I got to know them really very well, cause they wrote, you know, thousands and thousands of pages about me and about everything else that they felt was wrong with the world and their, their fantasy is more real to them than reality and other people are not really human and people who disagree with them are not human and so therefore they feel justified in uh threatening violence and actually trying to be physically violent and intimidating towards me i'm four foot ten and to um to you know yeah and, and it, it's there's just so many parallels trying to get me fired trying to get me evicted trying to get me run out of town um you know but the, the only difference was that there was a lot fewer of them there's only about a dozen of them in Victoria, as opposed to the 2,000 or however many that showed up on on uh, September 20th. Um, so it was kind of an interesting window 
into that uh, identity politics and how that becomes, you know, it just, it just takes over your whole brain and, and, you know, every people are either bad or good. Like you said, it's very binary and either you're with us or we can destroy you and, and feel no guilt and feel like we're doing a good thing. There's way too much of that in the world. And I think I, I kind of get your parallel too, um, except it, the big difference is when you say a white supremacist, most of us generally think, okay, you're in deal with some nasty people, right? But when you are talking about pride groups or gay straight alliance groups or, right. you know, SOGI or, you know, allies, they're <laughs> supposed to be the good people, right? And so actually standing up and saying, wait a minute, um, there's mm -hmm. some things going on that just don't feel right. Now you're fighting the good people, right? Those are the, those are the halo people, you know, and, yeah. and, and the victims yeah. of this world. And now you're, you're victimizing people. And so it puts, it puts you in a really strange spot when, when you're, yeah. you know, raising your hand and saying, you know, there's been some situations that are occurring that need to be addressed. Yeah. And I don't want to go too far on this digression, but, um, you know, in, in their minds and, and in the minds of everybody on, on the, the sides, they don't call themselves white supremacists. They call themselves patriots. And, you know, and there's some overlap probably with that, with the One Million March. You know, they're, they're patriots. They're standing up for the country. They're going to get rid of, purge the moral rot and all this, you know, rhetoric. And, uh, and I think to a lot of people, you know, the, that the, what you just described is kind of reversed. And the, the rainbow people are always bad and the Christians are always good. And, you know, again, this is just this dichotomy that we see everywhere. Um, and I've, of course, coming to one of, one of the great blessings of being canceled is finding out that there are really good people on, on both sides. Some of them may be misguided, some of them may be misinformed, uh, but there really are good people who, who don't wish harm on anyone on the other side. I wish that there were more of them and they would hold the rest back, but that we haven't been seeing as much of that. I, I really, I really, really resonate with that. And I think that like uh, Serena was saying earlier that, you know, the people need to be educated about what's happening, right? Once Janaya showed people the, the book, they're suddenly realized, oh my goodness, I'm actually against it too. So I think that a big mm -hmm. part is like you say, tons of really, really good people that uh, are just not informed enough. But uh, the one thing that I cannot get out of my head is Janai's story, because I can understand people being so aggressive and angry against uh, something uh, illusionary, like a program or an ideology. But how do people find so much anger to, to be angry at a mother that's protecting her child? It's not. It's not a system trying to come down on society or anything. This is literally one woman trying to protect her daughter in 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 a community. And where is that right. hatred from? Yeah, I think okay. like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Zoe. No, you go ahead. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, how can they? Uh... Well, because, you know, it's always, they always come back to the same things. Like, you're making our community look bad. Janae, by confronting that pedophile, you're making our community, and they're kind of telling on themselves there. When you're, when you're outing a pedophile, when you're, when you're, when you're trying to track down a pedophile, and then all the, the transgenders and trans allies take that personally. What is that saying? What are they saying about themselves? that we need to mm -hmm. defend pedophiles or else we'll look bad. And that's what they're, that's exactly what they're doing. They're saying this poor misunderstood person who the, that predator. And I, I wish I had, uh, you know, th that story, the, the, the second part of that story really needs to be told more. If I, if you ask me and committed well, horrific acts of violence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what, this again, unfortunately, like with the police, um, I'm not going to get into it too much, but I, I'll just say I know someone who is a police officer and he actually had something just about gender on his Facebook. And before he before they actually would like would hire him and this is on his personal Facebook. And keep in mind, he doesn't have his real name. It's like a fake like, name or whatever that goes by on Facebook. Um, they made him take it down. So he wasn't even allowed to have and it wasn't anything transphobic. It wasn't anything. It was just like about like gender ideology right um and they said that they wouldn't mm -hmm. hire him 
force unless he took it down. And even for me, when I called the police, um, when that happened that day, um, when they brought me in for questioning, they made it seem like I was the um, aggressor. They made it seem like I was in the wrong. They asked me not one time, not two times, but three times how I got, you know, a five foot four, 160 pound like girl, how I got this man out of the change room. And I just told the line, said the same thing that I told them the first time, but they were trying to catch me. And, um, but, you know, they tried to catch me in, in the lie and they were trying to do it so that they could uh, charge me with something. Like I didn't feel safe. They weren't protecting the child. They were, they were literally trying to protect the pedophile. Um, then when I ID'd the person who did it, um, cause I had a bunch of people reach out to me and they were like, was this the person? And I'm like, yep, hundred percent. I sent it to the cops. I'm like, this is the person. I think that the, the point is it, I think it makes people that the, the activists angry because it's such an inconvenient issue that that has to be dealt with because it's much easier to say, um, when somebody says that they're a certain gender, when they say, I'm a woman, that you believe it. It doesn't matter how they dress. It doesn't matter if they pass. It doesn't matter if they make an attempt to look female. They should have access to everything that that we have access to and should not be challenged at all. And early on, when I went to the Soju website, it, it's no longer there. The Soju website has changed. But early on, I saw something really key on the website because violence... For women, violence is, is very real, and the perpetrators are, are, are usually men. Let's face it. If you're going to get raped, yeah. you're going to get sexually assaulted, it's going to be a man. But on the Soju website, they they said that, you know, um, that sexual violence and abuse is is really not linked to gender. It's, wow. it's about people, you know. <laughs> now, I can't find it. I think I did screenshot it. But I remember thinking, like, this is interesting. So, so they don't understand, like they don't want to even talk about this touchy topic, which, which is, you know, what happens to us now that these, you know, the, the, the rules have changed and now we have to start sharing very personal private areas. What happens when we come across somebody that makes us feel uncomfortable or, and, and, you know, in your case, it was so blatant and there really isn't an answer to it. What can you do? Um, there is well, no answer. What can you do? Like you saw that activist, Jenea, that came into our event, who was very emotional. And I said, well, why don't we have trans prisons? Because we know, uh, we know at least one woman has been, has been raped with the new, you know, trans inclusive policy. And we know that in prison, a good majority of people, especially the men that are in prison are psychopaths. And one of the key factors of psychopathy is lying. And maybe they're going to say they're a woman to get into a woman's prison because maybe they have ulterior motives. Um, <laughs> and that's a very dangerous place. And she, you notice that she didn't want to answer that question because it's inconvenient and it's it's just something they just don't have an answer for. Okay, so instead she said that she didn't believe in jail. <laughs> Right. So you either yeah. just you either just don't believe it or you just say, well, this doesn't this isn't possible. And then when it is possible, then attack the attack the person, attack the messenger. Don't deal with the issue. But let's attack Janelle because maybe there's something wrong with Janelle. Janelle, you're so mean. Like, how could well, you how could you do that? You know, like, how could you do something and then talk about it and bring danger to the community? Because that is sort of where this this unfortunately ends up going all the time and I this is a trend I've noticed yeah and even like I did invite even lesbian women and um they put out a big nasty post about me um when that happened at the pool um you know saying we support the transgender and you know basically I'm shitty and I'm slandering the transgender community which again I don't know how people make this shit up in their head because I haven't once but whatever um but anyway I said they they reached out to me and um, said, you know, can we have a chat? Because they kind of knew me a little bit. And um, after they slandered me all over line, they reached out and said, do you think we can have a chat with you? And I was like, absolutely. I would love to. I invited them into my home <clears throat> um, with my girlfriend. Um, and uh, because my husband was out of town and I was like, you know what? Like, I don't want to be like alone. Like, I need to like have somebody else here with me. 
So they came, they brought, I think they might've even brought that first girl, Jennifer, that came in that day. She looked familiar to me. So I think, I don't know though. I don't hundred percent, but anyway, they brought them into my home. Anyways, we, we were talking, whatever the, how it ended was the fact that they, we said to them, so, so what do you think? Like the, what do you think the, um, you know, Jennifer or the person, the person with the transgender, um, uh, hang on, I'm going to screw this up. She was married to a man. Now it's a transgender woman. Is that right? That's how that works. Right. Am I, am I botching something? I'm so bad at this. Like if, if it's, it's a man and then they, that's go, right. Okay. So yeah. So anyway, yeah. so she was married. So now she's married to a, a transgender woman. Anyway, she was telling me how uh, the person, they, you know, her, her wife can't leave the house and do this and do that. And she's scared to go to the pool and all this. And I was like, and just all about me, 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 my family, my family. And I said, Hey, I'm so sorry that that's happened to you. I said, but never once have I said anything negative about the trans community. I said, what's happened to you? people have, you know, done this slandered my name. They've put in pictures of my kids online. Like, so I'm so sorry, but like, you know, I've never said anything negative about your community, but your community is actually like attacking my family, my business, my livelihood, like, you know, all this. And they didn't even want to hear it. They didn't care. And I'm like, well, you guys yourself attacked me. Like you, you two women actually posted negatively about me on your Facebook. I never said anything about you. Oh, well, it wasn't just about you. It was just, you know, we're having, and I'm like, okay, backpedal, backpedal. And then, and then uh, it ended with, me saying, well, I'm so sorry that you think that this has happened. But to me, I'm going to keep on speaking out about this. Because the thing is, is this is children's safety. This was my child's safety. This is children's safety. And the thing is, is safety trumps all of it. So your your mm -hmm. your partner can take care of themselves. I can take care of myself. My child cannot take care of herself. She's vulnerable. Kids are vulnerable. And our children's safety should come paramount over anything. And they said, no, they didn't agree with that. They didn't agree with the kids kids safety should be paramount they they didn't agree and I was like okay well I guess we really have nothing else that we can talk to because we're not going to agree because I 100% wholeheartedly disagree with anybody's rights coming before a child's rights so, so let me get this straight they they're so supportive of rights that they support a pedophile's right to identify as a woman and have yeah. total act are you serious yeah. yeah that's how it ended that's literally how the meeting ended like uh, we were like okay well I guess we're done I, I can't, I can't even handle this. Like this was literally a pedophile. And you're saying that that's okay. They're like, well, well, no, we don't support pedophiles. I'm like, well, you do, because you're telling me that what I did was wrong and what I'm doing by speaking out is wrong. So you're supporting that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In Scotland, a young girl was required to, during her testimony at her rape trial, refer be yeah. appropriately respectful of the gender identity of her accused and refer to it hurt when she penetrated me with her penis. Yeah. Like, like, come on. Like, when was this? When was this? Was that was, a year ago? Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I, that, yeah. that was 2022. Yeah. Yeah. We Brought need legislation government. like they have in the UK. We need legislation that, that protects. Can you imagine you know, the, the level of manipulation that a rapist can hold over somebody because mm -hmm. you're remembering something traumatic and the thought you're going to have is that you were raped by a man, not a woman. It, it's <laughs> so what happened? What happened to this victim? Oh, she held it together and he went to jail. Um, but a, country but he went, a woman's jail, over. right? A woman's a jail. Yeah. No, he ended up where 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 he jail. can continue to rape women, right? He ended up in a man's jail. It brought down the government. Well, that's good. Yeah, it was. Was that the was, one where yeah. Nicola Sturgeon lost her job over the whole thing? Okay, good. Yeah, because leading yeah. up to that, they had the head of the Edinburgh Rape Crisis say something about women should reframe their trauma or something. And this was a this was a man with a gender identity who was head of that rape crisis in Edinburgh, who lied his way in because they, they had a um, sex segregation policy that only a woman, an adult human female. Could apply for a job there he came into the country 
already with his identification as female and sat quietly for years and years and years until he got to the head and then announced that, oh, I'm a man with a gender identity. Yeah. Wow. I have a hard time calling the transgender community the transgender community because what in the world does a tomboy have in common with a gay man? And what in the world does an autogynophile have in common with like a lesbian? I see a whole lot of manipulation of children is what I see. And lately up and down the island, I see all these posts for gender this, gender that. And some of the age groups are mental. They're like five years old to 24 with older mentors. And some youth groups are like 12 to 24. And I'm like, even thinking about a gay youth group. I wouldn't want under 16s over with those 24 year old men. No, men are men. What is going on here? Like, this is a recipe for abuse. This is worse than the Catholic Church. At least with the Catholic Church, you could find an ordination record. Oh, it's it's John Smith, who's now Father Father Dave, or I don't know. But with these guys, you go for the name and you get crucified because that's dead naming. And the, the, it sounds like their sexual records are being coming attached to their new gender identity. It's just mad. Oh, I was going to ask, how did that happen? Because when I changed my name from Kelly to Kenneth, my credit rating followed me. <laughs> you know, like my credit history followed me. So how can a criminal record get lost when they track the credit rating? That says something about the values of our society that are very sad i think it talks about the breakdown you know overall i mean um just take a look i mean you it, people are robbing stores on on the regular and and they're not getting arrested you can you can steal you can walk in broad daylight you can steal from a big department store even a small one and the police aren't going to aren't going to bother arresting you if they do it doesn't stick so I mean I think it's sort of maybe part of a greater issue that there there is a problem with our with our penal system overall. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone, it is now like seven thirty six, and I've kept, we've all been talking for an hour and a half. I think we should probably start wrapping up. It's been a great conversation, but I just want to be mindful of everyone's time. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to have to peace out here and get my kid to bed. But thank you so much, Thought, for putting this on. And I'm so sorry again that I was late, everybody. I was dealing with... It's going to be re it's gonna be recorded on Rumble. Okay, cool, cool. Right, I'm, glad. I'm, su I'm super glad that I look so awesome. Hi! <laughs> uh, but yeah, awesome. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you again so much. And um, and it was nice to meet everybody. If you want to add me to Facebook, anybody that doesn't have me, please feel free to. So. Okay. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Great chat, everyone.